The Commentary Booth is a show for media lovers by media lovers just like you. If you want to support the show, go to jamyapsmedia.com. Welcome to The Commentary Booth, the ultimate weekly entertainment recap and review show. My name is Jamie Apps, and each week I'll be joined by a rotating cast of co-hosts to run you through the entertainment media we've consumed during the week. Along the way, we'll provide you with insightful commentary and reviews. This week, I'm joined by a teacher who lists her favourite movie as the entire Harry Potter series and favourite TV show as Parks and Rec. Welcome back to the show, Leah Poulton. Hey, how are you going? Good, thank you. How is everything your way? Yeah, all right. Um, Be keeping busy. Back to school after school holidays, so that's always fun. Mm, First week back. First week back. Yeah, it's been interesting. Kids needed a break, teachers needed a break, but I feel like the break wasn't long enough. Yeah, especially with everything kicking back up with the virus and everything. Yeah, that's right, and kids are getting very complacent, so... Teachers are getting a little bit antsy and it's a bit tough at the moment, so. Hmm. How are you coping with this weather too, trying not to drown? Yeah, trying not to drown today was pretty rough. I had to drive two hours to to and from work and I was blown all over the road and then I had my hood on because I had no raincoat, so I was running through the playground area. I think kids were trying to talk to me and I'm just full pelt. I'll talk to you later, not today. <laughs> <laughs> too wet stuff this. Yeah. It's a good time to watch TV though, right? Exactly. I watched so much stuff over the weekend. Yeah. It was just like, I woke up, saw the weather, I was like, "Mm, nah, I'm going back to bed and I'm just going to watch movies all day. That's right. That's what I did. What did you check out? Uh, Well, I watched the HBO Slender Man, Beware the Slender Man documentary. Have you heard about it? Yeah, it's an old one, isn't it? It is an old one, but oh, I really love the story, but I've never seen like an in-depth story on this. And the documentary like follows the parents of the girls that are um, involved. So basically this is three girls. They're all in sixth grade, so they're very young. Oh, they've been friends since, since sixth grade. And they're 12. And these two girls believe in this character called the Slender Man who has like faceless man who preys on children um he's created and there's like a competition on the internet and basically they thought that if they murdered their friend they could become slender man's like slaves or i don't know how to explain it but like they attacked their friend um with a knife in the forest believing that slender man would come and save them because they were like lonely kids um the girl survived her name was peyton Um, but yeah, the documentary is really interesting because it shows their like police interviews six hours after and it's super cold. I'll give you, I'll give you a quote. One of them said to the um, detective, do you know how far I walked? And the lady's like, I'm sorry, what? Cause I had to walk into the forest. Do you know how far I walked? I'm usually not that athletic. I'm really proud of how far I walked. Like that was the first question she asked the detective after she just attacked her friend. Yeah, that's definitely the mind of a sane person. Yeah, that's right. So, like, um, two, the two girls, Anissa and Morgan, Anissa, her internet searches are, am I a psychopath? Am I a sociopath? Um, whereas Morgan actually was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So Morgan... Um, has schizophrenia and they believe that she attacked because she, in her mind, Slender Man was real. So, like, she was um, deemed criminally insane, but Anissa put Slender Man in her head in the first place. It's like this friendship just had this catastrophic ending um, with their friend being attacked. toxic to begin with. Yeah, definitely. So it was really interesting to watch because... You can see the parents and they just had no idea that their kids were going through this, um, you know, feeling lonely. On the internet, the parents say, like, we we weren't monitoring them, we didn't think anything was bad, but they're on all these websites and 
they believed this thing and they plotted it and yeah, it was a really interesting documentary. I definitely recommend watching it. Yeah, I think I saw it when it first came out like a while ago, but I think the key answer to if you're Googling am I a psychopath, I think the answer is probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> like if, you, if you've gone far enough to be like, maybe I need to Google this. Yeah, probably yes, you are. Yeah, I mean, well, at least you're self-aware enough to, to check. Um, but, yeah, very interesting. And they're still in jail, the girls. I know that um, I read somewhere that Morgan's been sentenced to 40 years in a psychiatric hospital, so at least she's getting help. Um, and Peyton's lived a, her life like she's gotten better, the victim. So I know. It's, it was just really interesting to watch. I definitely enjoyed it. It was one of those ones that I was like, at that one stage it was on the weekend, I had to go do something. And sometimes I watch half a thing and I just go, oh, I can't be bothered to go back to it. But this one I definitely was like, nope, I'm going back to this. I went back to it three times. <laughs> it was good. Um, the whole, like, Slender Man phenomenon is pretty crazy when they break it down. Like, it yeah. was all this sort of websites. And it was like multiple websites group think how to make how to make the scariest character on the internet basically yeah that's right and they've got all these pictures that people have like um superimposed his image into and then they're reporting it as fact so you can imagine an impressionable young kid see a picture and they're like oh yeah that's real not realizing that people are you know there's this thing called photoshop (laughs) yeah that's right yeah and then they've got all these history sites and like people like this is the story of slender man and they even it's like some people are saying that he's this scary character that preys on children, but then other takes on it are he's a character that protects children, so he's taking them to a better place. It's like romanticizing this idea. Yeah, that's the the problem with the internet. Like you can pretty much find anything to suit what you want to think. Yeah, that's right. Not necessarily true fact. I know it's just crazy that it led to this crime of like two girls that were like they're twelve and thirteen. Like, to get to that point, it's just so crazy. Yeah, way too young to be murdering someone and ruining your life. Yeah. And it's just, like, some of the some of the things I say, like, I wrote down some of these quotes. Like, she was like, oh, I was really surprised that um, I wanted to kill her, but I'm very excited. Like, that was her <laughs> her take on it. And then poor Morgan. Like I, like, I know that Morgan did the attack, but I feel like she was definitely – hindered by her mental illness. Like she said, I wanted to be locked up so I wouldn't hurt her, but I didn't want to make Anissa mad, the other girl that wanted her to attack. It's just crazy. Yeah, that's, that's like that whole idea of peer pressure and stuff as well. Like yeah. Kids are so easily pushed into things that they don't really want to do. That's what I mean, and it's just like a lot of true crime, I always get really intrigued by like what are the circumstances that lead into an attack and it's just like these two girls I think if they hadn't really met it probably wouldn't have transpired but there's somehow they got pushed together and it just snowballed into this horrible crime uh, what, have you, what have you been watching this week? Uh, so the main one was probably Athlete A, the new yeah. documentary on Netflix. Yeah, I watched um, a little bit of that interesting story crazy story but something that I've kind of always felt like Olympic level gymnastics has always been that kind of weird off-putting sport because of the age yes they're so young yeah like they're they're kids they're not professional athletes I know don't they say like gymnasts they retire by the time they're like 15 yeah well even like the main girl Maggie Nichols that the documentary focuses on she was aiming to go to the Olympics and she hadn't even finished high school like she was still in high school looking at college I know it's sad so yeah like the documentary focuses on sexual assault within the US Olympic gymnastics program particularly by the the doctor or the physio Larry Nasser the way he like inserted himself into 
their lives and how he managed to get the access that he had was just super creepy. Yeah. Another F scene character. Yeah, because I think he just sort of, he realized that everybody in that program was so like strict and demanding of these young girls that he realized if he was nice and sort of the the one kind person in their lives that he could sort of get away with whatever he wanted. That's right. And then he's like um, arguing that it's all part of his treatment. Well, at the start anyway, like when he was touching them inappropriately, it's all part of the treatment and they're young. They don't know any different. It seems like no one was really guiding them. Yeah, exactly. Like when he was saying he was putting his fingers in them and stuff, it's just like, that's just disgusting. Like, what are you doing? Completely inappropriate. And who was there to argue for them? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like they're only 13, 14. They don't sort of understand that that's not a medical procedure that he's doing. Exactly. Like they're young girls. They just want to be the best at gymnastics and they think that this is going to help them. Um, so they've just put, yeah, the wall's been pulled over their eyes. Yeah, just seeing like how hard they're pushed to, like going to that whole, they go to the Olympic camp and aren't allowed to see their family for the whole time they're there. Like that can't be good for them mentally either. No. I mean, I had a friend that was a gymnast, you would know her, um, and the stuff that they put them through is just insane. Like to go to the AIS and um, do all that training and then do school on top of that. Like I don't know how they have the time in the day to do anything. Mm, yeah, like even like all athletes like that, but then those girls are just so young, like – least people that are a bit older, they can sort of decide how they're going to manage their time a bit better. These girls just had no idea, really. They were just doing as they were told. Yeah, that's right. The main girl that focused on Maggie Nichols, like, it definitely looks like she was blackballed out of a Olympic spot because of because she had the courage to speak up and be like, hang on, this doesn't feel right. Yeah. They were, were they trying to squash it, the story? It's like moved her out. Yeah, so she reported it. She reported it to a couple of people at the facility and was like, this doesn't feel right. And they're like, okay, we'll investigate. And then it just, nothing ever happened. And like, yeah. Her parents were like, oh, let's. They spoke to the program facilitators and were like, oh, can we find out what's happening? If not, we're going to go to the police. And they're like, no, don't go to the police. We're, we're investigating. It's all going to be sorted out. And it just never Kept went anywhere. Going. Yeah. Oh, we're getting to it. We're getting to it. They're just trying to push it back and push it back and push it back until um, they just give up, really. Yeah, they were just kind of just waiting until she obviously got too old to compete. Yeah, that's a tactic in itself, isn't it? Yeah. It, it really proved that the uh, the governing body of gymnastics was way more focused on money than they were actually protecting and looking after these athletes. Yeah. Which is sad. Definitely. Like, yeah, there's money in it, but you also got to think these, these are young girls that still have 40, 50 years of their life to live after they finish. And that's, yeah, that's right. And this is going to affect them forever. Yeah, exactly. Like they're not like, golf players or stuff like that who are going to be competing at the top level for 30, 40 years. These girls have maybe six years. Yeah. I get two, if they're lucky, three Olympics out of it. Is he in jail now? Yes. Good. It only recently came out, right? Or the trial was only recent. Yeah, I think it only, like, wrapped up this year. Yeah. Good riddance. This documentary just really exposed everything and I think it showed a lot of people that didn't know about the story, the whole story. Yeah, and you know what? It's really good when um, these documentaries come out because it provides the victims with a choice to, like, actually speak out. And once one does, I feel like there's a snowball effect. They all feel empowered to do so, so that's good. That's definitely what seemed to happen here. Maggie spoke out and then... It got squashed for a little while, but then eventually once the newspapers got a hold of it, there was 
way more girls in the program that are like, oh, hang on. That's kind of what happened to me as well. Yeah, yeah, and then they're brave enough to talk about it. Yeah, because they don't feel alone. They don't think that it was just a one-off thing anymore. That's right, and the media has such a powerful like um, role in society to do that, to expose these things. It's their responsibility, so good on them. Hopefully now that it's sort of been exposed, the, the whole sport as a whole can kind of refresh and rebuild now. Yeah, and you think, I hope that they um, put things in place now. Like if you've got a physio there, what things are you putting in place to protect your athletes? Like one-on-one treatment or do you have, like if they're underage, there should be someone that's there to support them and, you know, provide a, an opportunity to talk about what's going on. Yeah, there should be a second person in the room. I mean, that's right. As a teacher, I can never be in a classroom on my own with a student. Yeah, like one-on-one. Yeah, so I think that's something they should definitely put in place. I feel like even that's changed since we were at school. Like, I'm pretty sure I had one-on-one conversations with teachers after classes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, it does happen. So if I am in a classroom on my own, I will always walk to an open doorway and I'll have my conversation in an open doorway with that student until they leave. Because you can't obviously guarantee that you're going to be everyone out before you go. Um, But, yeah, you just put things in place to make sure that you're not alone. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Was there anything else that you managed to check out? There is. I watched um, a three-part doco series on Netflix um, called Fear City, New York vs. the Mafia. Have you seen it? Actually, I think you saw it today, right? After you mentioned it, yeah, I sat down and watched it yesterday during the rain. Oh, good. So, yeah, let's, let's check this out, see what Leah's on about here. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I mean, I'm not really into mob or mafia stuff, but I was like, you know what, this sounds like a really interesting, and I've heard a little bit about it here and there, but um, it was pretty good. I liked the whole, like, 70s vibe, like the footage from the 70s, and it was really, like, kind of cool, but I did wane towards the end. Like, my interest waned a little bit. How did you feel about it? It definitely could have been tighter. I don't think they needed three full hours. Yeah. But um, I liked the idea that they actually played the recordings that they had. Yeah. So like, like It would have been the, super dry without those. A hundred percent. Like, I mean, the, I feel like the first episode was really good because it kind of told you about, like, the mafia and how much control they had of New York City and what was going on at the time. Like, they controlled everything. They had hands in hospitals and all this stuff. They literally were like, and the FBI said, we can't win. Like, there's nothing we can do. It's just going to keep, like, because they had, what do they have? Like, the the boss and then you have the, what's the next in line? Yeah, so they had it, they had the boss and then they had the underboss. Uh, then they had... Soldiers? Or captains and then soldiers. The reason that they could never prosecute the upper level guys was they technically never did anything illegal. That's right. They they put it down the line. They just told the people below them and then it was pretty much always the soldiers doing it. So the the cops would only ever arrest one or two guys and then be like, okay, so we just got the guys that actually pulled the trigger or... Yeah, exactly, but... They needed to get they needed to get the top guy. And they were like, hey, well, we don't know how to do it. And then what, they had that episode where they went to the, um, is it Cambridge University? And they created a law to be able to, like, um, say that if a mob boss gives the directive to do something or if someone gives a directive to do it, they're just as guilty for that crime, which wasn't in there before um, the 70s time. So they had tons of manpower. Uh, bugged all of the crime bosses' houses, the phone lines, the car, and just kept creating um, or, like, recording this audio and then talking about all their inner workings. So that was interesting. The audio definitely made it more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The When they introduced that RICO law, like, that just totally changed the game where they didn't have to... They didn't have to have evidence that you actually physically did something illegal. They could just be like, you ordered this. You were all organized yeah. to do it. 
they could prosecute them as it was almost like prosecuting as a business rather than individuals. That's right. I loved the way that they um they managed to get the bugs into some of the locations too. Yeah, I saw them um when they did that one in the car and they kept practicing and practicing and practicing until they got the tiniest like time window to put the bug in the car. That was pretty cool. Yeah, and then they stuffed it up by hooking it up to the battery and draining the guy's battery multiple times. <laughs> Like, oh, oops, yes, got to get that out. Oopsies. Yeah, it was really interesting. The TV, when they hooked it up to the guy's TV. Right. And they were like, they were intentionally putting interference into his cable service <laughs> so that they had an excuse to send in a technician to work on his TV. Yeah. So nerve wracking for that guy. <laughs> and then he, he, he just rang his mate being like, So I'm banging on this, and his mate would just press the interference button so it stuffed up, and then he managed to, like, be allowed to pull the TV apart and hook up this bug, and then, like, is it working now? And his mate just didn't press the button, so it worked perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy that guy had to go in there, though, and have, like, a straight face and know what he was doing. I don't know if I could do it. With those dangerous men. Especially when the guy that answered the door was a known murderer. Yes. Exactly. Like, oh, my God, I'm in big trouble if this goes bad. Down wrong, yeah. Like, if this goes pear-shaped, I'm stuck. They're definitely interesting people, the mob, hey. Don't want to say too much in case they come for me, but <laughs> um, just the way they spoke on the phone, I was like, oh, my God, I've, I've never heard so many swear words unless I'm at the, I'm at the, play, at the playground at school. But <laughs> they were just carrying on, and then the guy was having the affair with the maid. They heard it all, those poor people. Yeah, and, like, just talking about, like, absolutely criminal activity with the, the wife and kids just next door and having breakfast. Yeah. What are you doing? It's just, like, that strange thing of, like... Like, no secrecy. They were totally blatant about it. Well, I think they think they thought that they could just do whatever they wanted. They got away with everything, so... Yeah, well, initially they could. They've just had... Nobody challenging challenging them at all. Yeah. The way that they just infiltrated every part of New York, like, oh, we'll, we'll install this guy as the head of this union and we'll put in one one bloke's daughter as the, the receptionist and then we just control the whole thing. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah, they just had everything. That was like the golden era of the mob, they said, the 70s. Yeah, and... Um, what did they say that the uh, the fuel racket that they had? They were making like a million dollars or something a week. Yes, insane type just of money. Just by not paying the tax. Yep. Like that was smart. You got to give it to them. That was smart. Yeah, and like it was super hard for the, the FBI and anyone to even. Well, that's what they said. They realized how out. they were doing it. What did they say? They went to the front door and they were like, "So we we know you're doing something." But we just can't figure it out. So can you just tell us how you're doing it and we won't prosecute you? Yeah, just just tell us so that we can stop other people doing it. And the <laughs> yeah. mob's just like, no. Nope. Like, I'm not that stupid. Yeah, so it was, an, it was definitely interesting. <laughs> I'm making a million dollars a week. I'm not going to tell you how so that you can stop it. That's exactly right. He's like, oh, I'll, I'll make your sandwich or whatever he's doing. He's like, I can do that, but I won't tell you the rest. Funny, but ridiculous, like, how violent they took it points oh yeah and they weren't afraid of doing some horrible horrible things like that documentary was a bit shocking at times showing the bodies with you know they had a what did he have a card in his hand like this is my message this is who did it and this is why it was done the guy at the end that was one of the bosses and was killed by the other bosses and like the the photos they had where he was just slumped over with the cigar still in his mouth like yep Holy dooly, that went down quickly. Definitely. That, well, that, the thing is, like, they're all in it for money. Like, they, they, I've watched a couple of other things. I don't know if you've seen Mob Wives. Have you heard of it? They just, a lot of these, like, ex-mafia men just say, like, in, at the time you think you're, like, one of the, the group. It's like a family, et cetera, et cetera. But then you get to realize that you're just being, you're just a pawn in the game to make money. You don't really mean anything. Yeah, true. Like, they talk about it as... Like even the FBI said they had it divided into the five families, but 
family is probably the wrong word. The wrong word use. for it. Yeah. I don't know. There was some show on um, MTV and it was talking about some people that were like ex mob or ex mafia. They all just said, like, you don't realize it until you're out of it um, how much you just, yeah. Yeah, it's totally a business. Like, they That's don't right. actually care about you. The only reason they care about you is they, because you know something that could get them in trouble. So they, they'll protect you until they don't need you anymore. That's right. Uh, on a totally different track, I watched the 2017 film Call Me By Your Name. Okay. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. So it stars Timothy Chalamet and Ami Hammer, and it's set in northern Italy, and it sort of focuses on the budding romantic relationship between the 17-year-old boy Elio, played by Timothy, and the 24-year-old Oliver, played by Ami. Okay. It shows a young boy coming to terms with his sexuality in like a really realistic raw and believable way okay it has him he has like a relationship with a girl and then sort of starts to question it and then he has sort of the moments with oliver and eventually sort of they have a connection and a relationship happen right how old are they are they young elio's 17 and oliver's 24 okay that's kind of like a older, younger dynamic where Oliver sort of obviously knows that he's gay and is sort of showing Elio the way, yeah. And, like, helping him understand what's what's going on inside him. Yeah. Interesting. It's all about the, the emotional connection between the two, but okay. there's also some pretty graphic physical sex <laughs> scenes. Okay. In particular, there's a scene which involves a peach, which is oh. pretty full on. A, a peach? Mm-hmm. I will I'm have sure to check that out. I'm sure you can imagine what, what happens with the peach. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what part of the peach. Think American Pie. Oh. Think American Pie, but less funny. Oh. More graphic. Serious. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know. I might have to check that out. Just for the peach scene. Oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> the peach scene was not the highlight. It was just okay. the bit that stuck in my brain for the. <laughs> that, that's, that's burned into my eyes for a long time. It'll be in your dreams tonight. Mm hmm. <laughs> it's obviously like. It was obviously a really uh, poignant film because it was Sony's third highest grossing movie of 2017. Okay. And it's the fifth highest rated film on Metacritic for that year as well. Okay, so it's good. Yeah, yeah, really touching film. Like, okay, good. The last, no, definitely... the last scene's pretty sad too. Okay. I won't Aww. give away what happens, but I definitely was yeah, don't. almost crying. Yeah, don't. I'm going to check that out. I don't cry in movies, but lately I've just been such a cry baby. I don't know. And sometimes when it's like a sad movie or something, I just, and I know it's going to be sad, I can't watch it because I don't want to get emotional. <laughs> you don't want to cry, but. Yeah. What, what has been getting you to almost cry? I don't know. I'm just an emotional wreck sometimes, like nothing. Oh, I don't want to do work. I start crying. My dog almost makes me cry because she's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Has she got more energy now or is she still just. Oh, look, she's, I think she's used to being held because obviously with her not being fully um, microchipped, I have to hold her everywhere. So she's definitely used to that. So when we hold her, she's really calm. But as soon as she's down, she's off. Yeah, she's definitely got. Yeah, at soccer the other week, she was just. Yes, she was. She. How how are you so sleepy? She'd had a big day the day before with a friend. Like she was um, hanging out with another one. So I feel like she was definitely overwhelmed. And um, puppy school was interesting. She had her first lesson last week, so... How's that going? Um, she's a star pupil, I'd like to say. They were all too scared to come out and say hello to everyone. Like They led the puppies out and they're like, we're going to go say hello to everyone. The first one just dug his hands in and was like, I'm not leaving where I'm sitting. 
The other one came out two steps and ran away. And he goes, oh, try Piper. And I'm like, yep, try Piper. And so she just bolted out of the thing. She was jumping all over everyone. Yeah, that was Toby. Toby yeah. was like that. It's like, oh, I get yeah, to play with other dogs. This is the best. Yes, it is. Except now we have mum's dog and he just hates. Leave me alone. Yeah. Now he's just a grumpy old man. All right. Well, Piper can be pretty grumpy, but probably gets that from a dad. Uh, and then, yeah, the last thing I checked out was season three of The Sinner. Okay. I've heard, I've definitely heard The Sinner's good. Yes. Yeah. Season one is still probably my favorite one. Okay. But they're all really good seasons in themselves because of the way it's structured. It's an anthology, so each season is its sort of own self-contained story. Okay. And then they're all just they're all tied together by Bill Pullman's character, Harry Ambrose, mm-hmm. who investigates the the cases in each season. Okay, I like that. It's good for people that want to jump in now. They're not looking at it being like, oh man, I've got thirty episodes to try and get through to be caught up. It's Right, you could jump in at any time. You can look at the season outlines and be like, okay, that one sounds like it's the one that I want to check out first. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, season one is focusing on a lady called Cora Tanetti. Yep. And it sees Harry investigating her past after she snaps and, like, stabs a man to death at the beach. Okay. Which opening scene is like what the hell is going on here it's really violent sort of it's yeah it's pretty violent okay and then you sort of find out like what led to that moment as the season progresses yeah and then season two focuses on julian walker and it has harry investigating julian who's like a young boy after he poisons a couple oh poison interesting and male too Usually females are fans of the old poison trick. I love that you know that. <laughs> I do. I feel like, well, they say men and crime, they don't care about the violence. Women don't like to get dirty. So poison's the easy option. Yeah, I've heard poisoning is the, the preferred method for ladies. Yes. Which is creepier than it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out, Sean. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> If Sean starts getting sick in the next few months, I know where to look. You know why. have it on tape. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. And then, yeah, season three is the most recent one. It follows Jamie Burns, and it has Harry investigating. There's a fatal car crash, and Jamie's the sole survivor. Okay. And they're trying to investigate, like, what led to the crash, what happened after the crash. Was the crash an accident? Maybe it wasn't. (laughs) <laughs> okay, got to check it out. <laughs> but yeah, um, season three didn't didn't grab me as much as the first two. Okay, like it was still good, but it, I think because I was so had so much anticipation after the first two seasons, it didn't quite hit that level. But right, I would definitely recommend checking out season one, and then if you like season one, keep going. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's probably, I think that's about all I've, even despite all the rain, I didn't watch too much. I know. But, uh, so yeah, my recommendation for the week is Call Me By Your Name. Okay. I would say, I know it's an oldie, but the Slender Man um, HBO series definitely was really good. So thank you for listening to the commentary booth. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. We should hit 500 downloads this week. Woohoo! You can follow me on social media at Media, and you can follow Leah over on Instagram at l.polton, P-O-U-L-T-O-N. The commentary booth is a fan-funded production of Apps Media. You can support the podcast alongside our magazine, Jamzine, over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash jamieappsmedia. The following people supported at the Jam publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support. 
Brian and June Hart, Courtney Paulson, Tracy Apps. Mm-hmm.